I get started on the afternoon session. So I'm going to be talking briefly about the trans transparent reporting of a multivariable prediction model for individual prognosis or diagnosis. So this is the tripod statement. Uh, I'll explain a bit more later, but briefly, this basically sets out best practice for reporting on your prediction model. So this morning we've done how you develop and how you validate prediction models, and then this is more focusing on how you can inform everyone else about your prediction model and what the best method of doing that is. So the motivation, so obviously the agenda, yeah, so I'll talk about what the basics of the good reporting is. I'll then review the tripod statement. You should all have um, read those, the Chad's to Vask paper and the tripod statement, and we'll do an exercise based upon this where we'll get you to go through the, the, so the tripod statement has a checklist, and we'll go through that, and we'll get everyone to uh, give the grades that they think that uh, this paper deserves, and then we'll decide whether this model is actually well reported on. So what we have to think about, so what is a requirement for clinical implementation? So you have to remember, whenever you're building these models, the idea is to improve patient care. So as Peter was saying this morning, you know, he starts off with the aims of the Odyssey uh, community, which is we want to impact on patient, uh, patient care. So how can we go about doing this? So one of the main things you need to take away from a prediction model and actually reporting on a prediction model is the clinician should be able to identify for who. So this is our target. So when you report on this, it should be very obvious immediately for who, it's, for who they're looking for. So for instance, if we're doing prediction of stroke in patients with AFib, your title should be something like prediction of stroke in patients with AFib. So that, and then, so clearly we can get the who predicting what, there would be the AFib, uh, sorry, there would be the stroke, and then ideally have the time at risk as well. These things should be instantly clear because you don't want your clinician to have to think about anything around this. You, should, they want, you want them to know, yes, this is for my patients, yes, this is predicting the outcome that I'm concerned with. The other thing was we want evidence of performance. So is your model well calibrated? Does it get good discrimination? These are the sort of the two key metrics that we think are uh, interesting. This, I, I, we really can't stress this enough, but almost all prediction models that are published, or certainly most of them, are very badly reported on. So uh, things, that, things that I've seen missing are the actual model so you can read a paper and you'll, have, and you'll not have the model in the paper or any instructions on where you can find the model. Um, a lot of places, a lot of uh, the actual reporting on the methods isn't very good, so you can't really tell whether they use cross-validation or whether they, what, actually what, what algorithms they ran, what their data sources were. And these are all things that are really key to have if you want to be able to trust the model. So when we're talking about this, this is how we can address this. It's a framework that's set up that you have that if you follow, you will report very well on your models. And if you tick all the boxes correctly, I should be able to take your paper and reconstruct your study using my own data. And that's really what we want to be able to do. And the other thing that you want to be able to take away is that a clinician can read your paper or they can read the paper with the model that you've provided and they can understand who it's for and what impact it can have and how it can do this. So one thing to stress is this wasn't just this isn't just one person's opinion. This was a 25-member-plus committee of experts. So we actually have one of the authors who was in the room this morning, so Avout, who you've probably heard from. He was part of the coalition that helped form, helped write this. It also was reduced down to 22 items, just to try and simplify it. So you're not you haven't got this three-page checklist to go through that I think we all know no one's actually going to follow through on. Whereas with 22, it's one side of A4 it becomes a lot more of a feasible problem for you to go through. Um, so one thing, so when we're looking at the titles, so you want to say, are you developing, are you validating a model, or are you doing both? And you want to say, so here we go, estimate the probability of coronary arch disease. So we've got the outcome, who it's targeted for, and the target. Sorry, yeah, and then you've got the target as well, which is here. So you want, are you developing and validating a, or validating a model, or are you doing both? what's your target population and what's your outcome. I would even possibly go further and say you might want to have your time at risk in the title, but this is something that we can have up, you can have up for debate because you, maybe you have multiple times at risk or something like this. Um, what was the goal of developing this model? So when you're reporting on this, it should be really clear why you chose this as a problem. So I think something that we've been quite keen on recently 
is looking into guidelines, and you'll see in a lot of guidelines, oh, this drug is contraindicated in patients at high risk, or patients who are at low risk and more should be given this kind of intervention or this treatment. But for a lot of these uh, guidelines, they don't specify how you should decide on whether your patient is high risk or not, and there aren't adequate prediction models that will tell you whether your patient is high risk or not. So that's something that you always want to keep in mind is why are you developing it? What problem are you targeting? How is this going to impact on the patient's care? And then when you're reporting on this, you want to make sure that you include uh, the say, this, so anything you see in bold is the kind of things that you can almost swap in for your specific problem. Uh, another thing is the source of your data. So, I mean, this is really nice because it's saying exactly who the data, who the data, where the data was found, what the limitations on it are, how many people you have, and then you're saying like, uh, where were, the, were these people excluded? Were they included? What kind of criteria you have you have for this? And you want to be really clear on reporting this because. Oftentimes, um, you'll read a study and it, will, and it will say something like, oh, for patients with stroke. But I mean, I think if you've got 15 people in a room, they might be able to come up with 15 definitions of what stroke looks like in your health records. Whereas if you say stroke and we used these specific codes, then it's much easier for me to then take your model and validate it. And I can also understand better whether it applies to my own patients. Um, methods, yeah, so. What, what was predicted. I've actually read papers before where it's not entirely clear what they're trying to predict. Um, and really, if, you, if you're not clear on what you're trying to predict and you're building a prediction model, or I read your paper on a prediction model and I come away thinking, I'm not quite sure what you were trying to predict, I think we can all understand that this is not a good position that you want to be in. So make sure you explicitly state, oh yeah, I'm going to predict this outcome. There shouldn't be anything left up to kind of assumptions or chance. Um, and then the other two, so how is it measured? So this is again, we're looking, yeah. Uh, predictors, yeah, I wanna know what goes into your model because if I wanna validate it or I want to understand it, I want to know what you've put into it. Uh, I think we were having a discussion this morning that with some of these more complex models, so the model we built yesterday had 62 covariates into it, but you know, I've developed models where they have 7,000 covariates. Now, that's not really feasible for you to put into a single paper. So this is one thing that I think is open for discussion that we can get into later is how you could go about creating some kind of reporting procedure for doing that. But one thing you always have to remember is that if you are going to build a prediction model, then even if it is just a list of the covariates that you use, it does need to be accessible somewhere for the people that are reading this, in, both in terms of like, oh, if I want to apply it, or I want to understand it. It's like a real key part of the open science procedure. Um, statistics, yeah, so you want to say what type of model. I want to know, uh, yeah, are you using Cox proportional hazard? Are you using a gradient boosting machine? Are you using LASU? Are you using deep learning? You want to state what this is because, and again, you're being a bit you're more open. You're giving me an idea of what your model is. And then also, what your, what, how you decided to validate it or how you understand whether your model is performing well. So I want to know did you, a discrimination, what's the calibration, how did you do it, how did you understand whether it's a good model or not. You should make this really clear to me because if, we, if I don't really know what the metric is that you're using, I can't really say whether your model's good or not. And then I also can't really compare it to my own. And particularly if you're thinking of clinicians, if you're, if you're a bit mm, wavy about uh, how you measured whether your model was any good, then they're not gonna take it up and use it in clinical practice. And as we said, when you have this, you always wanna be focusing on how is this gonna provide an intervention for my patients? What is it for patients? What is it gonna change? How can I get the clinician to trust it so that they will use it to, cha to possibly change their diagnosis or their prescription or the treatment pathway for their patients? And metrics that say whether your model is good or, good or not is an incredibly important part of that. And then results, so the model specification. So this is nice because you're, you're saying what all the coefficients are. Like we said, I think something that definitely needs to be discussed is when you end up having maybe, you know, this is what, 10, 12 covariates there. This is quite feasible to put into a table, but if you're getting to 60, 90, 150, some of these more common models, then there needs to be an idea. But So we actually have a nice app, which I think we'll see later, where you can explore the results of these models, and we think that's probably quite a good way to do it, but 
we're not saying that we have the, all the answers or we have the best solutions, but we're going to provide an example of how you could report on these more complex models, um, which I think particularly are going to start to be used more and more because you don't, uh, some of the more the earlier prediction models with five or six covariates were great because people didn't walk around with computers in their pockets. So if you're a clinician and you need to calculate this, having a point score where you have to fill in six variables is great because you can do this on the fly. And you didn't have the capacity to do, you know, to sit there and type in 60 different covariates. Whereas now I think that with the, with the capacities that we're hoping to develop to integrate these models straight into your care system, you can have a much better system of doing this and you can use these more complex models. But that also means we still have to have very clear reporting standards for the more complex models. And then results, so what's your performance? So always show your calibration, always show your ROC curve and probably report on the, the area under the ROC curve as a discriminative um, statistic. Uh, calibration is really key. So uh, if any of you were in the lightning talks yesterday, I mentioned that you can have two models that have a similar discriminatory performance and it's been demonstrated that the better calibrated model will have a better clinical impact. So you always want to look at your calibration, particularly when you're doing external validations or if you take a model that someone else has developed and you use it on your own data, if you look at the calibration, you can then uh, perform some kind of recalibration and that will give you a better overall outcome using the model. So what we're going to... Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a couple of summary metrics for calibration, but I don't have any that I particularly like. Uh, I think the best way to do it is actually to use these graphs. Um, so in the PLP package, which you can explore later, we have a couple of different options for making these. So we have one that's a bit more like this, which is a traditional one. We have a linear fit model where you split the data up into, the, into deciles of risk, take the average risk and see how the average risk performs, and we have some newer features which will do uh, a local regression fit. Uh, I actually really like the graphical uh, way of doing it. I think some of the metrics, uh, they can actually be a bit misleading and you can think you have a well calibrated model when you don't or you could have a poorly calibrated model when you do. But yeah. Um, yeah, so I think in the interest of time, so we're gonna do a small group exercise. So, okay, I think we're gonna, just in the interest of time, we're gonna stop the small discussions there and now we're going to go through the checklist together so uh, I know everyone started at different points hopefully you've got through certain sections of it but basically just if we ask a question and you have an answer to it just shout out your grade and then we'll have a discussion about it so I'm going to kick off with what do we think of the title do we think like are we thinking A, C or F yeah have you done you got, so what grade would you say? A. You think A? So from the title, you could tell me what the, the what's the target? target is AF. And AF is in the title? Yeah, title, she, she mentioned uh, resource financial metrics field, but it's... In the <laughs> subtitle, yeah, are we, but, okay. What is, does anyone else have an opinion, a uh, grade on the title? Would you be, like, when you, read the, when you read Validation of Clinical Classification Schemes for Predicting Stroke, do you know what the target and the outcome is from this, or? So you don't think, so they don't think the target's in the title. I know it says results from the National Registry of Atrial Fibrillation, but that's not, uh, if I was, if I, like, if I read this, I want you to say, predicting stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. But I think we definitely said this has got a partial, so we want to put a C in this box. Okay. And then, what about the abstract? What do we think of the abstract? Uh, So three A, you'd say C. Yeah, is anyone else? Think on the abstract, we're thinking. 
for 2AC is good. And then, uh, it's different. Yeah. And a 3A. Yeah, so what about the background? How do they explain the medical context? Someone got to question three? Medical context, anyone? But what do you think they're missing? Do you think it's, how come? So we've got an A, we've got a C. So I, I actually, I put, I put A for this. I thought they did a pretty good job of explaining the medical context and going into the background. Other opinions? Anyone else? Well, yeah, I think co context is a bit strange that they depend on clinical characteristics of AIDS. And the final sentence is they may aid in the selection of not antithrombotic therapy, which is actually the context, which I say, but they, they reserve it like a surprise for those last words. Right. So it could have been. So it's full of music, but it's great to <laughs> Okay. So what would you say? C. Everything's going to be in the middle. Let's <laughs> see. Okay. Um, so specify the objectives, including whether the study describes the development or validation of the model or both. What do we think for this? Someone got... You think it's pretty good? You're quite, you're quite positive on this paper, so you don't think so? So what do you think they're missing? clearly describe if it's uh, only development or development and validation. It's definitely development, but uh, the rest is uh, let uh, it's a bit unclear, less, less, you think? Uh, unspecified. So, so does anyone else have an opinion? So you think A, you think C? C or F. F? F. You think F? Okay. Yeah. Are you okay. Um, so I actually, I again, had, I again had C for this, simply because they don't really explicitly say whether uh, they're developing. That was for uh, the study objectives. Specify the objectives, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on. So 4A, describe the study design or source separately for the development and validation sets, if applicable. What grade have we given them for this? We give an A because we they mentioned about what, type, what kind of data, data set they're going to use and what type of baseline characteristics it includes. So we give an A. Yeah. Um, has anyone else got an opinion? Well, I got an A. So, hi, they've got something right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, specify the key study dates, including start of accrual, end of accrual, and if applicable, end of follow-up. What do we grade? Do we give them a grade for this? Uh, that so, yeah, F. Clear F. Um, what have we got next? Uh, specify key elements of the study setting: primary care, secondary care, general population, including numbers and location of centres. What do we think for this? <coughs> there is seven states <laughs> and hospitals, uh, but they actually, I'm not sure that they specified what types of hospitals, so they said that it's readmission, but I mean it can be, it's probably secondary care, but we are not sure, so it's kind of a, kind of a more to, towards C. C? C? I think it's pretty because good Because at least they, they, they mentioned something. 
And I think that so this it's is, not there. That's a common theme that's emerging is they sort of get towards these things but don't explicitly state it, which mm -hmm. I think is something we were discussing this morning, that when you're writing these things, it's, it's not your job to write it in a particularly like original or interesting manner. I want you to take your results and I want you to beat me around the head with them. I don't want you to be subtle about it. Tell me exactly what you did, why you did it, and what your results were. Uh, describe eligibility criteria for participants. What did everyone think for this? A? We agree? A? They are evaluating, but not in their study. So what would you say then? C. So we've got an A and we've got a C. Does anyone want to give us a tie-breaking vote? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that's something that's very positive, like putting, putting the codes in. Because it's like we were saying, you know, a definition of stroke. Saying earlier, you can have 15 people give 15 definitions of stroke. So having the codes go in is quite nice. Okay. So you're saying A, you guys are saying A, so you're outvoted, so <laughs> they get their second A. Uh, given details of treatment received, if relevant. So what do we think of this? Do they, do they get treatment? No. Is anyone, so someone else must have started a bit. of the tripod statement that we will probably take this out or so because there's now a statistics and medicine paper which has really in detailed perspective of what we mean with this treatment and how relevant it is and like right. intention to treat that people were in the treatment and you follow them versus that they stop treatment the similar discussions we have had in this context so so your advice so you is to give skip the, it. You'd give the yeah, tripod I, I statement think, an F for this. Yeah, so <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Pass. So maybe on the one hand you could, should say people should describe what, what, was, what happened to the cohort. Yeah. And the, maybe in that sense it can stay in. But the, the thing is, if relevant. And I, yeah. I'm struggling with that. I don't know what is relevant here. Yeah. Okay. Let's well, I think if you don't know, then we should just skip this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where are we up to? Uh, clearly define the outcome that is predicted by the prediction model, including how and when assessed. So what? So that, that group there should have that. You guys must have started a bit further forward through. We got. Do we think this? Yeah. So. Yeah. So here, the it's the stroke outcome, right? Yeah. Yeah, that seemed fine to me. Uh, can you tell me the time frame that they're predicting in? Let's see. So they had the maximum, let me pull it back up. Um, they talk about censoring um, with a minimum of 365 days of follow-up. Uh, they censor at time of non-stroke death or maximum of 1,000 days after index hospitalization. And then they explain what they do with multiple strokes. So seems fine. So you say they're predicting within 1,000 days? Um, time at risk or? Yeah, that's and that, that's what I would conclude from reading that sentence. Yeah. Okay. Do you think do you think they've specified this clearly enough? Probably not, but I mean, I, I'm assuming, given your question, that there's something I'm not seeing here. But <laughs> I know, so, I, <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think they particularly clearly specified what their time at risk was. But I mean, because I think they're saying sort of a thousand days with three hundred days of follow up, and they censored it. So I yeah, think I mean, it, it, it might be in there, but. Again, it's something that you maybe have to go searching a little bit for. And given that time at risk is, as we were saying this morning, it's a pretty, pretty key part of your model, I think it should be something that's, again, very clear, you should say, okay. predicting 1,000 days rather than. But I think, I mean, if you think an A, we can give them an A. <laughs> yeah? A? Okay. Report any actions to blind assessment of the outcome to be predicted. Do we have any opinions on this? I wasn't Not very clear what I wasn't sure whether this was yeah. particularly relevant to this. Ewald, can you clarify what this actually well, means? The, the idea would be that, that if you have a not so hard outcome, 
that you don't want that to be affected by the risk estimate, that you're looking better for the outcome if you're a higher risk, for example. So in diagnosis, this is a, this is a typical problem, mm -hmm. uh, that you have a, a test that is uh, suggestive of some disease and you're searching harder to find the disease. Mm -hmm. So that's why blinding came in. So it's because it's also for diagnostic models, right? That is the, 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 the trifold statement. But here for stroke, I would just say that's kind of a hard diagnosis. It's just not something that you need blinding for. Right. So um, it's not relevant. Yeah. Skip it. Give them a pass on this. Yeah. Um, clearly define all predictors. Do we think they clearly define all their predictors? Yes. Yep. A. A. Uh, I think that we're going to skip the other. Yep. Explain how the study size was arrived at. So we think in C, F, F. F. Yeah. It's like the, you know, you can guess that the the sample size. Um, is the same. <laughs> is the same that the whole amount of people in the registries. So they they didn't say that, but maybe it's kind of obvious. Hmm? Well, I think it, it's just lacking detail here. They yeah. really should have specified better how they come to their target cohort size. Mm -hmm. I would really call this an F. You call this an F? Yeah. Okay, we don't even pass uh, if the number is sufficiently enough. Yeah, right. That's yeah. Okay. Uh, so describe how missing data was handled. Mentioning. Mm. Got lost. Where are we up to? Ten, nine, nine. Yeah. What do we think? Do we? Did they describe their missing data protocols properly? Do we have any opinions on missing missing data? Good, bad, missing. Okay. I think when I went through this, I gave them a C because they sort of touch on it, but it's not. Okay. Again, not explicit. Uh, describe how predictors were handled in the analysis. Have we got any opinions on, predictors, on predictor handling? We should get closer to that. I think in the corner we're getting, what should, which, where do you start it in the corner? Which question? Okay, well we get to you then. We'll to you, yeah. <laughs> I think, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I gave him an F for this as okay, well. Okay, let's see, give you give your yeah. scores here, and then we move to that. Uh, specify type of model, 10B. They tell you what model they used at any point in the paper. They use a Cox regression, linear regression, deep learning, anything specified? It was probably uh, not applicable, just because it seemed like they, they had the, the weights assigned to each of the conditions that were part of the model specified in advance, so it didn't seem to be a data-driven predictive model. Do you think, yeah? So what would you give them? I would say that they said what they did, but I couldn't replicate it because I don't actually really, I mean, I, they don't really give a strong explanation of what they're actually doing. They say, you know, we fit this method in this package, and that's pretty much it. So C, F? Yeah. I'd give them a C because they said what they did, even if you don't really think it's good practice, they still kind of explained it. That's fair enough. C. Yep. Uh, for validation, describe how predictors were calculated. Do we have anything on this? Any opinions on how predictors were calculated for validation? I actually thought it was quite unclear all the way through the paper whether it was developing a model, whether it was validating a model, what data they used to develop, what data they used to validate. So. Yeah, I, I, gave a, I gave him a C, but yeah, I think F. Especially all measures to assess model performance. So this is sort of very, very key to model development. Do they specify how they measure their performance? C statistic. And any calibration? Didn't say anything. I saw any calibration in there. 
so that you're not being A. This is C, because we want calibration and. Yeah. Comments, yeah, I feel I'll read bias in because we are approaching from more uh, statistical uh, thinking. But back then, it's probably just a rule-based approach. But uh, they used uh, evidence-based uh, knowledge to reweight the uh, the two, the S, the the stroke history. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not a serious model building, but we are evaluating uh, the process, development process, using a more uh, modern thinking to uh, penalize it. So sure. yeah, I mean, I wonder it's not fair or not. <laughs> well, are you any of the co-authors? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah, I, so I think, I, think, I think that's a good point. Like, you know. <laughs> okay. yeah, it's, yeah, and I think that's, that's a valid point. But then, it's old, but still using. We are using this yeah. model. But I still, I mean, I still think. So you know, we're judging it by these standards. But they have, a, they have produced a model to make a prediction. And if they said, we've used, we've used expert opinion, and we've used some of the data to reweigh, right. then that's explaining what they did. But they don't really talk about it in much detail in the paper. So I understand. You know, it's not the We're not. I'm not expecting them to have done a train test split with a multiple cross validation. I think it's also in terms of design paradigm yeah. and type change. They didn't consider they had to report this. Yeah. yeah. I sure. mean I think sure. that's fair that's, enough. That's but then fair. this is one let's, of the reasons let's why. Continue this has with been the questions so. and then we can have a discussion yeah. in the end. Um, do they do any model updating? Sure. I think uh, mm, no. I think this was not particularly relevant. Just provide details on how risk groups were created if done, I think. It's not relevant. Yep. No. I don't think this wasn't relevant either. Um, validation, identify differences uh, in setting eligibility criteria and outcome and predictors. So we're now at. Now we're getting at yeah, 12, so that's 12. the core. So what did you guys think for this? F or, or not applicable, um, since there wasn't a separate validation cohort. Yeah, I think I gave them the same F or not applicable because I think it's I think you're, it gets a bit confused because they say validation in the title, which was again I guess we're looking at it from the more modern perspective of this is more a development process. But yeah, so I think again F such a principle. Uh, describe the flow of participants through the study. What did we? Uh, for 13A and B, we gave them an A. We thought they were pretty good at describing um, the number of patients they started with, who had an outcome event, and uh, describing the baseline demographic characteristics. Mm -hmm. Good. Has anyone else got up to this point? 13? No? OK, so yeah. Give them A's for that. If I show a comparison of the development data, I think this is, again, not particularly applicable in this scenario. Uh, specify the number of participants and outcome events in each analysis. Have we got a grade for this? I guess we said A, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily model development. You know, we did know the number of patients who had events. Yeah, I thought A. I think again we're sort of touching on they haven't. They're not quite explicit, but they do provide information on people that got the outcome. So. I think we're fine with that. Right, um, report an unadjusted association with each pre candidate predictor and outcome. Did they do this? Was this report actually? We got a grade for this? Uh, we said not applicable. It, it didn't appear that it was done. No, I don't know. Ava, do you have an opinion on this one? If so, not applicable. Now, 15A, present the full prediction model. F. F. So F. I think it's clear. But where do they give their model? 
So that's the model there. That's the predictor they, they, they tried to as, uh, validate in the model, right? And outcome is clear. So that's my understanding. But do you think the model is written in the paper? So if I said I have a patient, this is their index, this is what their yeah, prescription is. Well, I think I think it's pretty hard to find the model in the paper, actually. No, no so it, it's actually somewhere in 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 a table, I think, in a footnote in a table, somewhere hidden. But I would say if this is a paper about a model, you should that should be the thing in the paper, right? And I, I really miss that. So I, I don't think that's the way to report a model. Um, yeah. You should have a clear section about this. These are the model parameters, and this is how it uh, how you use it. Yeah. So you said. So you think it's good, but you think it's F. Does anyone else have an opinion? Do you think they did a good job of telling you what their model was? Yeah. No, there's no equation. No equation. Yeah. So that it should be F. F. Uh, where are we up to now? 15. 15B. Do they explain how to use the prediction model? Is there any, any explanation of when you should use this prediction model? It's at the end of methods, right? It's at the end of method. Not example tells everything, right? So, so you think A, C, F, A, C? <laughs> Who wants more? Uh, I would say A, but. Uh, yeah? Not. Chan? I'm not sure. Yeah, it can be A. A? <laughs> <laughs> this is good. So they don't tell you what the model is, but we're sure of how to use it. <laughs> this is quite a good position to be in. Uh, report performance measures with confidence, confidence intervals. Yeah. 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 We all agree. Uh, I don't think they did any of that. So not applicable. discuss any limitations of the study. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that was pretty good. Uh, for validation, discuss the results with reference to performance and development data. Do you think they did this? I mean, people have raised the issue that there's like not a clear distinction. What's the so people have raised the issue that there's not a clear distinction of what's the validation set, what's the training set. I mean, it seems like it was all training in this case. Um, so, so, lat grade. It's a statistic, but the fact that it's all done on the training, it's kind of. There's something there, but it's not completely, ob it's not really that well performed. So C? <laughs> yeah. I think that, sounds, that sounds like a C to me. It's yeah. sort of there, but <laughs> you come away, I think yeah, you come away a bit like, could be. Uh, we're almost at the end now. Do they give an overall interpretation of the results, considering objectives, limitations, similar studies? What does everyone think for this? So I, I thought they did a pretty good job of this. Yeah. I think they covered most of all the, most of the stuff that's included in there. So I think unless anyone disagrees, we give them another A. Uh, do they discuss the potential clinical use? So when you read this paper, you come away and say, hey, I know exactly where to use this in my clinic and how to improve my patient care. So by the end of the, the comments, they kind of summarize the clinical use. But uh, for our discussion, it's the, uh, the potential research, future research, they, they didn't mention much because this is not a research-oriented tool, I think. Yeah, I think that's, so what so would you give them? We, so we gave C, because it's like uh, yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Provide information about the availability of supplementary resources. I guess I was just this is 2001. I don't know. I was eight years old, so yeah. I wasn't reading scientific papers. So we're saying not applicable, or yep. And give the sort of funding. 
and the role of the funders in the present study. Yeah, I think I can. Yeah. Right. So bearing in mind that this is, I think you said every patient. Uh, so uh, we need to calculate, estimate, the, uh, calculate the child vet score in uh, every patient of with atrial fibrillation. So general prevalence of AFib in the general population is about one percent. So lifelong risk of the AFib is more than one percent, about three to five or ten percent if you uh, live up to eighty. So. Uh, one of you guys have will have this condition in your lifetime, so you need to know <laughs> the atrial fibrillation. So, <coughs> so current guideline it recommends to use anticoagulation in the patients with more than uh, two or more more uh, chest vest score. So, uh, first thing we need to do for these pa patients is not uh, treating uh, rhythm. We need to calculate the chest vest score first and then start, uh, decided to start uh, anticoagulation or not. A friend of mine, uh, a father of a friend of mine <coughs> actually has a atrial fibrillation. Uh, she was working with me uh, as an internist uh, in, in the hospital. And after one year, uh, he had uh, hypertension and diabetes, so he, he've got two score, uh, chest score. That's why he started anticoagulation. After one year, uh, he died of hemorrhagic stroke. So you, you can see how catastrophic it is if you uh, did right. not uh, well with the score system. It, it can kill the people with, with the treatment. Yeah, so I think, sorry, I think the thing to take away from this is given the grade that we've given this, do you feel comfortable using this? Would you want your doctor to sit there and go tap your numbers in and then say, going to use this to say whether I give you a prescription or not. Because I think, I mean... Yeah, I mean that, 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 that's a problem. So, so, so I respect uh, your, your story, of course. And, and that, but I think uh, there, there's a dis distinction between the reporting, which is rather poor, say, overall, or uh, unclear, uh, and the quality of the model. I mean, we cannot right. really know because the reporting was poor. But so essentially, I think the key issue is, is the validity of the model in giving absolute risk estimates. So in this case, two points. What is the absolute risk that is associated with that? And if that would be only, say, I don't know, 0.5%, that might not have led to giving anticoagulants. Well, if th that would have been properly validated, then we knew that the risk was, say, 5%. Yes, then there can still be adverse events, but then the decision making was really evidence based, and right. uh, so uh, I think the key is the, uh, the, the validity of this, this this score in the relevant population. And reporting, I fully agree, is is not uh, to be very enthusiastic about. So I think so. I think one thing we to follow on from that we're trying to demonstrate. So we've come away from reading this paper, and I really didn't know what I made of the score. I sort of, some of it seems like, you know, some of the uh, metrics that they provided seems to be pretty good, but then they don't really describe the model that well. They don't really describe when it should be used particularly well. So I think one of the things we want you to take away is that you need to follow these guidelines so that you don't have that issue because, you know, if you could build the best model in the world and if no one uses it, then you may as well not have built it. And the key to using these models is to report clearly and openly on what you've done and then hopefully the efficacy will demonstrate and follow through, but 